My first general practice experience was as a GP locum for three months in Blind Winby, which was a mining village in South Wales. I shared 24-hour roster cover with a GP from the neighbouring village, Julian Tudor Hart. He would invite me to visit him in, in, in evenings, and I found him a truly inspirational GP. He was working systematically with his patients to make their lives healthier through reducing their blood pressure and helping them change their lifestyles, getting them to look at their smoking, their, their diet, their exercise, or their, or their lack of it. And these villages were really impoverished. The GPs who worked there did twice as much work for half the pay than those living in more affluent areas. Julian taught me that the people most likely to need health care were those the least likely to receive it. And it was only many, many years later that I learned that Julian was actually an icon of general practice in the United Kingdom and that his inverse care law is famous. I followed in Julian's lead and I spent two years working in Jamaica where the need was certainly great. I spent six months as an obstetrics and gynaecology registrar in the downtown Kingston Public Hospital where I conducted hundreds of deliveries and I learned an awful lot about gynaecology. From there I moved to being a GP for a health centre just out of Kingston and they hadn't had a doctor there for a number of years. There was about 20,000 people in the catchment area but I was fortunate to have a great team of auxiliary staff. Patients would come in from the countryside and they'd be prepared to wait the whole day to see the doctor. And vendors set up little food stalls in the compound. Now I trained our community workers to give health talks to the large groups of people who sit in the shade of the mango trees. And th these would be on topics such as uh, how to treat children with diarrhoea. I used to drive to the downtown Kingston uh, depot to the ministry depot to wiggle drugs from them. And I trained our staff to, to write labels, count pills, and put these into bottles. So after every 20 patients, I'd stop consulting, and then I'd go and dispense my own prescriptions. And the patients were instructed to bring back the pill bottles for recycling. I mean, they, they were really hard to come by. So they were really told, you must bring your bottles back. And they did. And I used to estimate patients' hemoglobin levels by the strength of a copper sulfate solution that a drop of their blood would float in. Now, while there actually was a public laboratory available in the downtown Kingston Public Hospital, this was not generally an accessible option. And this was due to resource constraints because most patients couldn't afford the bus fare down there, but also the potential associated harms because the gun wars in the ghettos made going there very dangerous. So I've worked in community settings as a GP and a primary health care doctor ever since, and it's often been with high-need patients. I had a busy practice in Freeman's Bay in the 1980s where I was fortunate to have a hugely diverse patient population. This included clients of the City Mission and other, uh, other hostels in the area, included workers on K Road, and large Maori, Pacific, and recent immigrant populations. Freeman's Bay these days has changed considerably. I've also worked at family planning clinics, at sexual health clinics, and as a prison doctor. And for the last 30 years, I've also been a certifying consultant for termination of pregnancy at an Auckland clinic. Now, for several years from 1987, I was the GP for the Centre Boyd community, which many of you reading newspapers may be aware. One of the most valuable aspects of this experience was caring both for populations of people as well as for individuals and for families. As well as it being general practice, the role also often involved public health. For example, uh, when the community uh, had an outbreak of Guardia in their water supply, I needed to treat the entire population, the entire community. Uh, likewise, um, a, a visitor to the community who'd been working in the kitchen uh, identified him as being a carrier for hepatitis B, and we needed to... Um, in conjunction with the local medical officer of health, run a vaccination program for the whole community, which was about three people at that time. At these days, I do only one to two tenths of clinical work, including locums at the Auckland City Mission. Throughout my career, I've relied heavily on the advice and assistance of other health professionals, especially nurses, and I've always valued the team approach to primary care. On to research. The alchemist was a researcher, 
constantly experimenting to find the philosopher's stone. I've been involved in research projects since my summer studentship at the medical school with Rex. But it was Bruce Ayol who helped me launch my research career. Bruce jump-started my, my employment in the Department of General Practice by inviting me to do systematic reviews for ACC. Topics such as the rehabilitation of knee after surgery were not high on my list of interest. <laughs> However, I discovered that learning all the evidence about a particular topic, collating it and interpreting it, was a rewarding intellectual exercise. I was appointed a part-time senior lecturer in the department in 2000. And I've worked with Bruce on a number of projects, including a series of systematic reviews and meta-analyses, quantitative studies including randomised controlled trials, and also some qualitative research. And we still collaborate on a number of projects. Now, as Bruce alluded to, he and I are contemporaries. <laughs> we both grew up on the North Shore. And Bruce actually loves to tell the story that we went to school together at Westlake Boys. <laughs> now, now, the, the truth is, as the only girl doing physics at Westlake Girls, I had to run up the hill to the boys' school for physics, scuttle in late, feel intimidated by a class full of bright boys who had already done seventh form physics in the sixth form, and then I had to tear down the hill to, to join my other classes. So, of course, all the boys knew who I was, but I didn't know them, that Bruce was in that class. So he thinks we knew each other. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he, he was the head boy of Westlake Boys at that time. And, and as, as you can see from the, uh, uh, from the photo, that a, apart from uh, being clean-shaven, he's changed very little. <laughs> Bruce gave me these clippings recently. Um, I think his mother had kept them, as, as mothers are wont to do. <laughs> so Bruce is now the chair <laughs> of the Department of General Practice and Primary Health Care. Bruce inspired me to progress my academic career. <laughs> but I'm fortunate indeed to have met him along the way. And he's been a great so source both of support and intellectual stimulation, for which, which I thank him. Now, I started my research career conducting systematic reviews. And because I was mostly doing contract work, often under the guidance of other researchers, I became experienced in a variety of methodologies, including ra randomised controlled trials, validations of tests, interviews and surveys, and qualitative studies. But my research also covered a number of different domains, including policy, medical legal issues, ethical considerations, patient comorbidities, patient attitudes, communications, and practitioner values. And because of the contract nature of my initial research work, and my role as what Bruce has already told you was as the, the research narrator, my research covered a wide range of topics. And these included musculoskeletal um, injuries, forensic medicine, immunisation, anxiety and depression, workforce issues, palliative care, and upper respiratory tract infections. But I also worked in a number of different spheres. So this included things like domestic violence screening, the benefits and harms of genetically modified foods, ethnic differences and lifestyle issues and mental health, mother's beliefs in immunisation, understanding risk, communication skills. Now, of course, this, this actually reflects the eclectic nature of what is general practice in primary health care. However, my largest body of research pertains to various aspects of integrated primary mental health care. How we feel and the way we live our lives is integral to our health. And moreover, more than 50% of consultations in general practice will have a mental health component. So this research has been directed towards the development of a multi-item tool to improve detection of mental health issues and risky lifestyle behaviours. And my research has also been looking at brief interventions to affect change in behaviour and in mood. Since 2002, I've been the lead investigator in developing the CHAT. This stands for Case Finding and Help Assessment Tool. And it detects risky behaviours and mental health issues in adults in primary care and community settings. So the, case, the CHAT case finds for smoking, problematic drinking and other drug use, problem gambling, physical inactivity, anxiety and depression, abuse, 
and difficulty controlling your anger. There's been a number of studies involving the chat which have resulted in peer-reviewed publications and it's been evaluated in a number of primary health care settings. It's been found to be acceptable to both patients and practitioners. And it's been used to demonstrate ethnic differences in these factors between New Zealand, European, Maori and Pacific people. The chats demonstrated that though it's fairly low prevalence, problematic gambling is usually associated with a number of other comorbidities, such as problems with drinking, smoking and depression. And the chat's also been translated and studied in the context of Asian language centres. The tool's been validated against a, a composite reference standard. The chat's designed to be self-administered by patients before they come into a consultation. And a key component is the help question, which asks for each item whether this is something for which the patient would like help, either immediately or at a later date. Now, the help question has a number of advantages. It reduces the burden of the clinician at the initial consultation because then they're not overwhelmed with patients needing a number of other issues addressed as well as the one they're presented for. It's patient-centred and it helps patients assess their readiness for potential behaviour change. And it also helps them prioritise their problems. The validation studies we conducted have also found that the help question increases the specificity of the test, so it reduces the number of false positives and hence increases the positive predictive value. The use of the chat and, and, and the help question is now used nationally and internationally in a number of different settings. And colleague and British uh, Professor of General Practice, Chris Dowick, writes that scientifically, adding this help-seeking question to the two screening questions for depression improves both the sensitivity and the specificity of a family physician's diagnosis of depression. Ethically, it reminds us that our patients' concerns and desires should be at the heart of our medical practice. I'm currently completing a feasibility study in collaboration with Jim Warren, who's just up there, and his team in Nihi. And this is an electronic version of the chat, which is self-administered by patients on a touch screen or in, on an iPad in the waiting room. And the results are available to the GP as a summary in the patient's electronic record during the consultation. So the, the e-chat uh, can now lead seamlessly onto other screening tools, <coughs> such as the Assist for Smoking, Drinking or Other Drugs, the PHQ-9 for Depression or the GAD-7 for Anxiety. So if people uh, say yes to the first question and they end up doing the, uh, the whole PHQ-9 for depression, the GP will then get the scores and the interpretation of these tests if they have been completed uh, in, in the clinical notes when the patient comes in for the consultation. The next step is one-click links to decision support. The information sheets which can be emailed to patients or printed. Uh, you can, interventions can be discussed and these may be both drugs and brief interventions. For example, to assist with smoking sensation or uh, CBT for depression. A green prescription can be provided for exercise and links to a growing number of e-therapies which are now available. The synthesis, this, this idea of the synthesis of scientific and contextual evidence also plays a key role in our courts of law. Forensic practice involves examining all the available evidence about a circumstance, applying what we know from scientific literature, and then assessing whether the evidence in total may confirm or refute that an alleged event has occurred or was committed by the person who's been accused. So both the presence and the absence of evidence may need to be considered. And sometimes the evidence points to guilt, and then the accused may plead guilty or may be found guilty at trial. Sometimes the evidence points to innocence. The charges may then be dropped or the accused found not guilty. At other times, it provides an estimate of probability or improbability. Crimes do not have to be proved, only that the person is guilty beyond reasonable doubt. 